everyone. Welcome to our talk. Um, I'm Annie. Uh, we're just letting everybody come in. So come in, get settled. Uh, if you'd like to use the chat box function, you can let us all know where you're listening in from. It'd be really interesting to see where everybody is uh, around the country. Uh, and we'll get started as, as people come on in. Hello, we have people from Herefordshire, from Pitton, lovely to see you. We've got people coming in. Hi, I'm Annie. We've got Swindon, Forest Meadows, good to see you. Cheltenham, Plymouth, Wiltshire. There's a southern bias at the minute. I oh, know we've got some Wiltshire, Fife. Oh, there we go. We've got some up in Somerset, Leicestershire, Liverpool. Hello from the Scottish Highlands and hello from Pembrokeshire. So as everybody's um, coming in, um, please do come say hello. Uh, have a introduce yourself in our chat box. Let us know where you're from, uh, where everybody's kind of listening from. My name's Annie uh, and we'll get cracking once we've got everybody in. So we've got people from Warwickshire, from South Somerset, um, Paul and Andrew from Bellevue Shrawberry Gardens, I know it well, in Blackpool, uh, Orkney, uh, we've got Liverpool, hi, um, we've got uh, Northern Ireland as well, um, represented, that's good to see, uh, we've got Caroline from Mid Wales in Montgomeryshire, Sunday Ireland, we're going international, uh, Isle of Wight, so not just the, the mainland UK. So it's brilliant to see all these people from various different places, Manchester, Cornwall, sunny Cornwall, fabulous. So as everybody's coming on in, um, we'll get started. So I'm Annie, I've got Phil here with me as well. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves uh, when we get cracking. Um, but in the meantime, if you would like to put in the chat where you're from, uh, it's really nice to see the the balance of people we've got from all around the country. We've got West Sussex, Melton Mowbray, Froome, Somerset. So I think we've got the bottom of Cornwall all the way up to the Highlands in Scotland. I think is our furthest person away, maybe Ireland, Northern Ireland. So absolutely brilliant to see everybody here. So I think we'll we'll get cracking. So thank you so much, everybody, for introducing yourselves. Um, so my name's Annie. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted that you can all join us today um, as we explore the world of cutting and grafting, uh, which is a fabulous way of growing trees for free. So I'm, as I say, Annie Heslop. Uh, my teammate here is Phil Paolo, who I will introduce a bit more detail later on. Uh, I work with the uh, team tree council. Uh, we're part of the Life on the Hedge team, uh, and I help to protect hedgerows uh, and grow new hedgerows all around the, the country. Today, we will be chatting officially about the tree council. I'll give you a little bit of a, an introduction to what we do. Uh, and then I'm going to hand over to Phil uh, to learn all about cutting, laying and grafting, uh, what methods you would use and how you'd go about using them. Uh, a bit of kind of housekeeping, as it were, as we go along, I will invite you to put any questions that you have in the Q&A box. So um, that will be mean we'll be able to find all your questions really easily and we'll do our best to make sure we answer them at the end for you. So I will just share my screen. Perfect. And this is the bit where we get technology to work for us when it doesn't want to. Ah, there we go. So hopefully that shows you a slide for um, all about the Team Tree Council. So we work together for the love of trees. We uh, fund and plant and care for our trees. Uh, we do this with our um, community networks and our tree wardens. So there may be some tree wardens on the call today. 
So I'd like to say a big thank you very much to all our tree wardens uh, for everything that you do across the country. Um, we really can't do everything without you. Uh, we also work and inspire the next generation of young environmentalists. So we have a Young Tree Champions programme, Force for Nature campaign, uh, and we hope to inspire the next generation to care for trees as much as we do. We use science uh, and we use that to influence policy and best practice for the trees. So we work alongside government, academics, local authorities to make sure that we can disseminate the best information possible to make sure trees are looked after best uh, and that policies and practice reflect that. We're also really big on our partnership work. We have about 100 membership organisations within the Tree Council, and we all work together to make sure we get the job done properly. So a lot of our work is around partnerships with other charities uh, across the, the tree sector. Part of the work we do is we have a, a calendar of campaigns throughout the year, and we're currently in seed gathering season. So our campaigns start with, we have National Tree Week, which is the mark of the new tree planting season. Uh, and that kick starts uh, in November time. And it's a whole week of celebration of all things trees uh, and heritage. We then need to make sure we look after our trees. So throughout the year, we promote our Trees Love Care campaign, which in which we encourage people to make sure they don't just plant and leave things, but they actually look after them and care for them properly. We have a spring in the step campaign, which is all about making sure that spring is all on the forefront of our mind. And we go out and celebrate and look for all those signs of spring that nature brings. And then in May, we have National Hedgerow Week, which is a real celebration of hedgerows, uh, our, our humble unsung heroes across the countryside. But as I say, we are currently in seed gathering season. This started with the autumn equinox. And this is the time where we encourage people to think about new life, going out, gathering seeds, seeing what's growing, what um, can we harvest, nature's bountiful fruits at this time of year, uh, which leads us nicely to be able to talk uh, to you today about grafting uh, and all the different vegetation me vegetative means. So what I'll do is I will hand over to my colleague, Bill Paolo, Phil has over 15 years experience in the horticultural training field, uh, and he's also been doing this for uh, almost as long as that uh, as well. So you'll see kind of behind him that Phil's our, our kind of expert and he has all the things to demonstrate for you, the principles. So I will hand over to you now, Phil. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thanks so much, Annie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for joining us for this webinar. Um, I'm going to provide you with a, a kind of really basic overview of vegetative propagation. Obviously, it is a massive um, subject, so I could probably spend the whole day talking to you just about cuttings. Um, but because we've only got the hour, I'm going to I'm going to kind of streamline it and slim it down a little bit to give you some of the important concepts and just look some at some of the maybe the easier, more basic uh, methods as well that we can use. So. What we're going to look at um, over the course of the session, we're going to look at the general principles and good practice um, of vegetative propagation. I'm going to show you how to produce a hardwood cutting, which is probably one of the easiest types of cuttings, and I'll briefly talk about the other types. We're going to look at layering, so how you can actually produce a tree from a layer, and we'll discuss some different types of layers. And then we're going to spend the last part of the session talking about grafting. So that's how we can actually graft trees together using a scion and a rootstock. So to make a start with the kind of the general principles um, of uh, vegetative propagation, kind of the question is sort of why, why do we choose to use vegetative propagation maybe over seed growing? Um, both methods have got their merits. So the Tree Council really likes to promote growing trees from seed. Because what you get when you grow trees from seed is you get you get a really nice um, diversity of trees and you get variants um, in terms of the in terms of the parentage um, of that seed. So it gives it gives you a little bit more variation uh, within your crop. One of the things that you find from vegetative propagation is that you're producing clones. So when you when you take a cutting or when you take a layer, you're actually producing an identical plant to the um, to the parent plant. So a lot of times people refer to it as clonal propagation. And obviously one of the benefits of that 
is it will give you true properties. So in the same way, if you grow things from seed, maybe some of you be familiar with F1 hybrids, where you're guaranteed to get a particular item from a seed. The same happens with clonal propagation, that you're guaranteed to get a replica of the parent plant, an identical plant. Um, so what reasons why we might want to do this? So we may want to be growing a tree for a particular leaf type. It could be a leaf color. It could be a particular flower or berry form um, that we're interested in, or it may well be ornamental bark. So, you know, a nice example might be some of the really um, stunning silver birches that have very, very bright bark. So again, that's where we would use vegetative propagation because we would be guaranteed a particular, a particular result. When we grow trees from seed, obviously often there's no guarantee in terms of actually the characteristics that we're gonna that we're gonna get and you can get mutations and changes depending on the pollination of that seed so it's really around giving us a known a known plant with um, recognized properties that we're after um what i'm going to be looking at today is very much going to be around kind of home home grafting so some of you might be involved in community tree nurseries or you might be involved commercially in the tree world um, we're going to look at kind of some of the practices that you can do at home um, on a smaller scale. Obviously, if you're going to be doing vegetative propagation on a larger scale, you're probably going to need a greenhouse. You may well need some specialist um, propagation equipment. And for some of the methods, such as um, softwood cuttings, for example, I'll talk about those briefly. You do potentially um, benefit from having bits of equipment that will help you, such as uh, propagators, bench heating and mist units. Um, but really, I'm going to cover sort of things that you can do from home with minimal equipment and uh, on a very low budget as well. So we're going to start off by looking at some of the kind of the general principles and the good practice and some of the equipment that you're going to need. Um, one of the things that I find really handy is I use one of these plastic propagation trays. So again, you can put all of your all of your equipment in the tree tray, keep it in one place, and it also helps to keep everything tidy and everything in one place. So these I find really useful um, just to keep everything self-contained. Um, you're going to be using a variety of tools for doing vegetative propagation. Um, I'm sure some of you will be familiar um, with succotors, for example, here. So I like quite like to have a holster um, for my succotors because, again, it helps to prevent any, um, any injuries or accidents. Sometimes if you just put those in your pocket, you end up with a hole in your trousers or you've got a risk of cutting your, cutting your fingers. So I think a sheath for your succotors is very, very useful. Um, we're also going to potentially be looking at using a grafting knife. So here we've got a very simple um, grafting knife. Again, these are these are reasonably cheap to buy, and they start at five pounds, and can you know you can spend whatever you want on them up from there. Um, and generally, you've got your um, grafting blade there on one end, and then on the good grafting knives, you've also got a prying tool here, which you can use for lifting bark. So when you're potentially going to be doing um, some tea budding, for example, you would use this end of the tool for prizing open the bark so that you can pop your pop your bud inside. Um, one of the one of the key things to think about when you're doing um, any vegetative propagation is make sure your tools are, sh are sharp. So you'll often find accidents occur more often when you don't have sharp tools. So really important, maybe get yourself a little sharpening stone. So that's a sharpening stone for succotors or a small little sharpening device like that. Um, just to make sure your tools are really sharp because then they'll be effective. Sandpaper can be really handy uh, for your succotors just to actually give them a rub over and keep them clean. Uh, and another important thing that you need to think about is making sure that you've got sterile tools. So generally, when you're doing any form of kind of tree work or tree pruning, uh, propagation work, it really benefits to have sterile tools and to be cleaning your tools between working with different material. So if you're pruning one tree and you're going to move over and prune another tree, it's always really helpful that if you can if you can sterilize your saw, sterilize your succotors, um, it's going to prevent you moving infection from one tree over to another. The same principle applies when you're doing any grafting or any vegetative propagation, um, because again, when you're actually cutting into plants, you're opening up to them to the risk of infection. So try and keep your tools clean if you can. Um, something I use, so I use a very simple sprayer um, with a, a very diluted sterilizing fluid. Um, and I can just spray that onto my tools and then give them a little bit of a wipe down between prunings. Um, some people recommend using a little bit of Jay's fluid. So if you're if you're maybe doing bigger work, you can have a little bucket of Jay's fluid, dip your pruning tools into that and then give them a dry over um, and a wipe over. So 
Good hygiene is really important. And again, keeping a clean area is really useful because that's going to prevent the, uh, the spread of infection. Um, because we're going to be using reasonably sharp um, tools as well, I always carry a little first aid kit uh, with me. It isn't uncommon that you might actually give yourself a little nick or a little cut when you're doing when you're doing some grafting um, or some cutting. So just always quite handy to have plasters to hand should, should you need them. Um, something else I'm going to show you actually is I have got um, some grafting tools that I use. So I find these very, very handy. And for anyone who might be doing um, some grafting workshops, maybe with uh, schools groups. So maybe you're working with children um, or you might be working with people that aren't particularly confident with using grafting knives because they can be quite dangerous. Uh, these grafting tools are excellent. Um, they make it a lot easier um, to do the job and they make it a lot safer as well. I'm going to show you how to use these later on and they won't break the bank. So they, you know, these, these retail for sort of between 10 and 20 pounds. So if you're going to be doing a lot of grafting, they are quite a useful tool to have. Um, something else that you're going to need for your grafting is parafilm. So this is a waxy tape um, that's particularly useful for grafting. So it's a self-adhesive tape um, and it helps to make a waterproof um, seal that will prevent rainwater from getting into your grafts uh, and it will also keep the graft union nice and moist and prevent it from drying out so you get you get a good um, a good union from your materials. Um, something else that we commonly use in this sort of practice are rooting gels and rooting powders. Um, I'm going to talk about those a little bit later on when we talk when we look at layering but they're quite useful to have and they come in different forms. And probably one of the most important things um, to have is potentially some labels and a Sharpie for labeling. So one of the, one of the most important things to remember when you're doing any vegetative, vegetative propagation, any grafting, you want to make sure you label your finished product with the component parts of that plant. Um, that will help you to remember the variety um, and particularly if you've been um, you've been doing a graft, you may well want to note down the rootstock as well as the variety that you're grafting onto it. So really important. Try and keep these with you because it doesn't take long to do a little bit of grafting, get things mixed up. And then you can't remember what variety was this, what rootstock was that. So I say these are essential, essential bits of equipment uh, I'm using today. I'm using kind of some plastic labels um, again. Often these will last an awfully long time. Um, but if you would prefer not to put plastic back into the environment, again, you may want to use possibly a wooden label um, and you can write on that. Um, but again, the, the plastic are quite durable and you may want your plant to be labelled for quite a long, long period of time. Whenever, whenever you plant out a, a tree or a shrub as well, it's always important, maybe try and transfer your label onto your stake rather than on your tree, because you can get instances where they will restrict the growth of the new plant. So that's quite a, quite a good technique to remember. When you plant it, move your label over onto the, the stake of the tree rather than the stake itself, and then you won't have that, that restriction. Um, another useful bit of kit that you might wanna have is a potentially a lighter. So some people like to use a flame to sterilize their tools as well. So if you want to sterilize your grafting knife, you may want to heat it um, over a naked flame rather than using some sterilizing fluid instead. Great. I mean, that kind of covers some of the, the basic equipment um, that we look at. So what I'm going to move on to next is to actually show you how to produce a hardwood cutting. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the kind of the materials that we need to think about. But before you do, Phil, I'm really intrigued to know. So it's um, seed gathering season this time of year. But what would be the best time of year for, for, for doing cuttings? Ah, for doing cuttings. OK, that's perfect timing, Annie, because it does it really varies for the type of cutting that you're going to be taking as well. So a great way to kind of demonstrate this is if I show you this little section of growth here. So this is actually a piece of Bramley apple um, that I pruned off today. And what, what you can see here is you have different types of wood. And for different areas of the stem, you use those different sections for different types of cutting. So if you look right at the very right at the very end of the stem, where it's reasonably soft and green, I think I've actually got a better example. There we go. That's a better example there. So that's a lovely example of where we've got basically this is what we call softwood. So it's still green. Um, it's right at the it's right at the tip um, of the plant, and it's kind of the latest, the newest bit of growth. And this is the sort of material that we would be using to take a softwood cutting. Um, so often with softwood cuttings, it's literally just that little section there. 
Okay, and that's what we will be using. We often lose the majority of the leaves because these have a risk of a risk of drying out. And then we would potentially give these protection. So these cuttings, if you're doing it on a home scale, you can potentially make yourself a little mini greenhouse like that. So commercially, you would take a lot of these cuttings and you would pop them into a mist unit um, or a propagator to keep them hydrated. It's quite a process. So that doing, doing softwoods is a little bit more involved. So I wasn't going to go into too much detail on your softwoods today. Um, but obviously there's lots and lots of resources available online where you can find out a lot more detail about doing each of these types of cuttings. These are quite delicate. Um, and so they do need they do need quite special treatment um, when you're doing because they, they do dry out very easily. Um, the sort of trees that you might want to grow from softwoods are things like the, the maples, uh, so the Acer, uh, and also magnolias as well. And then with your with your softwoods, you would do those in the summer. So they tend to be summer, um, summer pruning, spring and summer that you'll be taking your softwood cuttings. Um, if we have a look at our section again, so what you've got here, you've got your softwood at the end. And then this is this is the current year's growth. So this is one year's growth on the tree. Uh, and what you have is as the as the wood starts ripening and start actually turning into wood, that's what we call a semi ripe cutting. So that's your semi ripe section where the wood is starting to harden. And then if you look further down the cutting, you can see the color changes quite radically. OK, and this is where it gets really woody. And then this is what we call your hardwoods. So you've got your hardwoods at one end, which are a lot more um, a lot more mature. That tends to be the previous year's wood. You've got the current year's wood at the beginning of the season as it starts hardening. It's going into your semi semi ripe, and then right at the other end um, of the spectrum, you've got your your softwoods. Now this is going to be quite important as we go on to look at some of the other techniques. It's quite useful to know which part of the plant you're going to be propagating from. I'm going to show you now how to take a hardwood cutting. So this is the easiest of the bunch. And so if, if you're new to cutting, I'd suggest this is probably the one that you want to start with because you'll get a hopefully reasonably success, uh, reasonably good success rate. Uh, it's also one of the easiest and the uh, the cuttings are less vulnerable. So I've got a nice example, I've got some um, osier here. So a really nice example of some willow. And willow is one of the easiest things to grow from a cutting. So things like willow, um, dogwood, um, plain as well, they all grow really well from hardwood cuttings. Um, and what we're gonna do, it's a really simple technique. So ideally, we're looking for material that's round about pencil size. So it can be a little bit thicker, it can be a little bit thinner, but optimum results you're gonna get from a, a cutting that's round about pencil thickness. Um, and what we want to do, if you have a look at the cutting, you can see we've got all of these little points where our leaf, our leaf junctions were. So this is what we call a node. This is a growing point. And then the section between those buds we call an internode, okay? And this is quite useful in terms of where you're gonna place your, your pruning cuts. And so what we want to do, we want to find the bottom. Um, I'm looking at this one. It's got a little bit of a curve to it. So I'm going to try and actually find it where it starts to straighten out as a stem. And I'm going to do a horizontal cut under that bud or under that node. So I've done a nice cut under that node, but I'm making sure I'm not getting too close to it. So I'm leaving a little, a little gap there just underneath. And I've done a flat cut. And then what I'm going to do, I want to actually get a section that is round about three to four inches in length. So I'm going to nip off um, my leaves. I don't need those. And then I'm going to get my section that's round about three to four inches. And then I'm going to find a top bud and I'm going to do the same procedure, but I'm going to do a sloping cut away from the bud, like so. And so normally we wouldn't have to worry about cutting the leaves off these because again, I'm, I'm doing this a little bit early. So the time for me doing your hardwood cuttings, as Annie asked around timings, this you want to do when the plant is dormant. So again, as the plant's coming into its dormancy, it's losing its leaves, that's the best time of year to be thinking about doing your hardwood cuttings as opposed to your softwoods that you're gonna be doing during the growing season. So normally we wouldn't have any leaf, but if you have a look here, that's a nice example of our hardwood cutting. And again, the sloping cut at the top is helping us to know which way's up and which way's down. We've got our flat cut at the bottom. It's around about pencil length. Um, the reason that we do a sloping cut at the top, it's not just to tell, help us to know which way's up and which way's down. It means that if we get any rainwater that's landing on this cutting, it's gonna run away from the bud. So we want it to be running away from the bud, which is gonna grow off in this direction. Okay, if you, if you were to cut it the other way around, 
you're going to encourage water co to collect around that growing point, around that bud, which could lead to some infection getting in. So it's it's really a mechanism for keeping the health of the health of the cutting going forward. Um, with hardened cones, so with willow and dogwood and things like that, they root so readily that we wouldn't need to use any rooting hormone with this. So again, we can just plant this in the ground and then hopefully um, this time next year, we'll have a really healthy, healthy root system on it. Um, one of the good practices when you do hardwood cuttings, obviously I've just taken a little section of this whole branch so I can produce some more cuttings. And if you have a look behind me here, I've got a nice bundle of uh, cuttings from the same plant that I produced earlier. So normally it's good practice. This one's a little bit on the thick side, but we probably will get away with it. I mean, again, I said aim for the penetrable thickness. Ideally, when you're doing cuttings, if you could maybe do them in kind of, you know, quantities of 20 to 30, um, and then you can bundle them um, like so. Again, don't forget to label them. So label what they were um, and when you took the cuttings. And you might also want to actually note down where you got the uh, the host material from. So you've got a little bit of information about where that where that plant was originally. Um, by bundling them, it means that we can plant quite a large number of cuttings because we should expect there to be some failures. So with hardwood cuttings, you're not always going to get 100% success. So it's quite likely that you may only get 70 to 80% 80, 80 success rate. So by doing quite a large number, it means we're kind of covering all bases and we're going to get a reasonable number of trees from those cuttings. Um, I've got a nice example here. So that's a nice example of a, help, a big group of these are actually black currants. So black currant again is another another really easy um, plant to propagate from hardwood cuttings. You can see I've just uh, mounded them mounded them all in there together, um, and then I will leave I will leave these in place um, until this time next year. So I generally leave them in for a year because we're coming into the end of the growing season now. So they're not going to be putting on any root, and then they'll probably actually start putting on root next spring and then develop that over the course of the year. Um, so we have a look over here. I've got a really nice example of this is a this is a, another section of willow. So this is a section of willow that I actually took last year, and you can see that the cutting has developed a lovely uh, selection of roots there. So this was grown in a bundle, and I I kind of just opened this up a couple of days ago, and then I've got a nice rooted cutting that I'll put in an individual pot and grow on from there. And I've got another nice example. So. This was some, uh, that was some dogwood that was done at the same time. So you can see that's produced some really healthy root growth. This is a, this is an ornamental variegated dogwood. Um, so you get really easy. So all I did, cut it off, popped it in a pot, uh, left it in there for a growing season. And then I've got a brand new, a brand new plant coming through. Um, when you, when you plant your cuttings into the soil, so obviously that's the length of our cutting, we probably want to do it about halfway depth. So about the, about two inches. Uh, because you want to make sure that you've got a couple of these nodes, so your growing points need to be buried within the soil, because that's where it will actually root off. It's going to root from those growing points. Um, and again, you may want to put it into a pot, so you could put it into a pot um, with a reasonably open compost and a little bit of soil that's going to hold moisture and encourage rooting, or you could just plant it straight out into, into a bed. So if you were maybe doing this on a larger scale, you may, might want to create a cutting bed and you can actually lay these out into a into a cutting bed. Um, again, as I mentioned, these are the the easiest um, cuttings to take. Your hardwoods. If you did want to do your um, semi ripes or your softwoods, you might need a little bit more specialist equipment. So, in terms of having a little bit of bottom heat or a propagator or a mist unit, um, and that's maybe something that if you're interested in that, start with your hardwoods and then explore um, some other coaching and other videos that will tell you a little bit more about taking a uh, different type of cutting. Um, just what a quick one, Phil, I'll just interrupt your apologies. Um, we just had a little couple of questions about, can you make um, only one cutting per branch? So, or would you- No, you no, no, not at all. Cuttings? So so what I'd normally do, so from a branch like that, I try and get as many as I can. So I, I get as many four inch sections as I could from that, but then I group them in size. So I do a bundle of cuttings that are that size, I then do a bundle of cuttings that are slightly thinner, and then I do a bundle of cuttings that are thinner, thinner again. So again, as long as you, you've got wood that is relatively mature, so we're looking for the hardwood. 
So the, the wood that's actually seasoned, uh, two year old, um, or you're going to end up sort of moving towards your soft. So when we get right to the tip of this branch, we're going into our soft wood cuttings down at the tip. Uh, but yeah, but I'd say try and try and get the maximum number that you can from your branch rather than having any wastage. So you might as well, because you're not going to get your 100 percent success rate, as I said. Uh, and will that work with hazel or oak? Um, so with hazel, you use a slightly, slightly different technique with hazel. So hazel, you tend to propagate by stalling. So um, this is where you actually create a stall um, from a from a hazel coppice and you can build around. We're going to we're going to touch on a, a little bit around rootstock beds later on. And I'll come back to I'll come back to how you do stalling um, when I talk about the um, the rootstock, the rootstock beds. Um, oak. Oak again, very happily will will grow from seed from an acorn. So it's a very very easy one to propagate from seed, but you can actually do a cutting as well. Thank Great. You. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about layers now. So creating a layer um, is is quite different from a cutting. It, it has the same purpose that you're looking to produce a new section of plant. Um, but one of the advantages of doing a layer is that you're leaving your material that you're propagating from connected to the mother plant. OK, so what I want you to imagine is imagine you've got a. A long branch like this that's coming from your tree that you want to propagate, or it could potentially be a sucker that's coming from the base, from the rootstock. Um, and what you can do, just going to show you on this bit of willow again is you can actually encourage this um, section of plant to root while it is still attached to the main host plant or the mother. So what we generally want to do, so we want to have a, a clear bit of stem. And then what we're going to do is we're going to damage the stem. So where we've got our, our node again, so this is our point where we're likely to get rooting, where there was a bud, we just want to cause some damage where that bud is. So the best way to do that, if you just use your sucker tears or a little, a little pruning or grafting knife, and we're literally just gonna damage the stem where that bud is. So I'm literally just scraping away just to cause a little bit of damage on that stem. Now, quite importantly, some people who do layering, they recommend that you damage all the way around the stem. Um, and what I find, I mean, that some of you I'm sure will have heard about ring barking, which is probably one of the, the easiest way to, ways to uh, damage a tree permanently if you sever the bark all the way around the tree. The same thing can occur if you actually do damage all the way around the stem when you're trying to do a layer. You can actually stop the flow um, of nutrients and water up and down the branch uh, and the whole section at the top will die off. So I always recommend if you're doing some layering, just damage on one side of the stem uh, and leave your, your cambium layer kind of complete on the other side. And then what you're going to do with that so potentially, if we wanted to do a ground layer, what we could do, we could pop on a little bit of rooting powder or a little bit of rooting gel onto that stem. And imagine this branch is growing down at the bottom of a tree. We could just lay it down, dig a small hole, and then pin that damaged section into the hole and cover it over. And you can have your branch kind of coming up out of the hole like that. So you imagine that this section in where my finger is, that's buried in a hole. And then we've got our branch coming out of the hole. We've backfilled that with soil. Now what will happen, the mother tree is still delivering um, nutrients to the growing point, it will still continue to grow, but then what it will do, it will start developing root around this section, and then hopefully over the course of a growing season, so a good time to do this would be either late winter, when you've still got a little bit of flexibility in the branches, or early spring, what you'll find, if you leave, if you leave the branches kind of on over the winter, they'll harden up a little bit, so you might be better off actually pinning it down at the end of the growing season and then it's in place while it's a little bit more flexible and less likely to break. Um, and then what you can do, leave that in place for the whole of the growing season. So back through to autumn the following year. And then if you dig it up, hopefully you will find that you've got a really nice rooted section where you've wounded it. You can just cut that off and then plant it into a container. So I've got a nice example here. This is a really healthy fig. So this is a this is a fig that was uh, produced from a this was actually an air layer um, that I'm going to show you later on. But you can see you can generate a really healthy tree very simply um, just using that principle. And the good thing is with a with a layer, um, it's much more it's much more likely to fry because you've still got it connected to that mother plant. Whereas with a cutting, 
you're severing it. So it's a lot, it's a much greater risk of drying out. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about air layering. So we kind of describe this plant, this, this section as being quite low down on the plant, where we could bend it down and get it into the ground. If you wanted to do the same principle on a higher branch, you do what we call is an air layer. And what you're actually going to do, you're actually going to imitate kind of bringing the soil up and round the branch. And you've got various different tools that you can use. So what we often will use for this, we'll often use moss. So moss is a really good medium for rooting. And what I'll often do is I'll often mix mi a moist moss um, with a little bit of rooting hormone. So I'll add a little bit of rooting hormone into that moss to encourage that rooting. Uh, and what a lot of people will do, you will take your moss and you will wrap it around your wounded stem and then you can then seal that in plastic and you can seal that so you've got a nice waterproof seal and then what you'll find over the growing season um, the the cutting will actually root into that moss above ground as long as it stays moist the secret is keeping it moist um, there are various other little gadgets that you can use so this is a little um, this is a little air layering mold that you can use and generally you do the same principle with this one so this goes and clips around the stem where you've wounded it you pack it full of your growing medium, so that's your moss. You could use a compost as well, and then you seal that up and that stays in place and will encourage a rooting section into that ball. Something I found with these, because they're a little bit open at the ends, they do dry out. So you often need to wrap them in plastic as well, um, just to keep the moisture in. So the key thing about an air layer, it needs to stay moist. Uh, if it dries out, then your roots are gonna dry out and it's gonna perish. Um, you might want to do your own DIY uh, mechanism. I, I use this quite a lot at home, which with quite a lot of success. Easiest thing to use if you get a small uh, small drinking bottle. Again, if this is something that you'd have anyway that you'd be recycling, it's kind of giving it another use um, for that plastic item. And what I do is I cut off the top and the bottom like that to make a sheath. And I then put a little bit of plastic around that sheath to give me a good seal. And what you can do, you can send your, send your cutting through and you would then pack that, pack that with moss. So your damp moss would go inside and you can then seal these plastic ends and tape them. And so you can see I've made a really nice sealed unit there that's going to be full of my growing medium. It's going to keep its moisture because you've got that bottle for rigidity and you've got the nice plastic seal as well. You probably just use some gaffer tape to seal that up. And then hopefully within, within a growing season, you'll have a really nice rooted cutting. Um, as I say in Blue Peter, here's one I did earlier. So we have a look here. I've got a nice example of this is actually a little section of rootstock. And we're going to be talking about rootstocks later on. So this is a rootstock that was growing at the bottom of a, an ornamental apple I had. And this was the, the plastic bottle um, that was around there. This has been on there for a growing season in my back garden. And I recently opened it up. And if you have a look, you can see we've got a beautiful, um, healthy air layer with lots of nice fibrous root. So I've, I've severed it from the main tree. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop this off later on. And then I've got my brand new tree. In this case, it's a root stock. That I'm then going to graft onto. So this is a way that you can potentially make your own root stocks, which I'm going to talk about later on. So that's the general principles of producing a layer. So you've got the air layer, which is above ground. You've got a standard layer, which is into the ground. Sometimes what people do when you've got a long stem, you can do what's called a French layer, where you can dig multiple holes and you can take the stem in and out of a number of holes from one stem and create maybe three or four uh, new layers, and that's what we call a French layer. Great. What we're going to do now, I've kind of covered a couple of techniques there. We're going to move on to have a look at grafting, and we're going to spend a little bit more time looking at the principles of grafting. Um, so, Annie, can you bring up the first? I, I will indeed. And while I do that, can I just ask, because I've obviously heard a lot about grafting and I've heard the term rootstocks. Um, can you just give us a little bit of background of why we would graft uh, and what a rootstock is, please? Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. So many, many of the trees that you'll see growing around the UK are grafted. Um, often, so, I mean, many of you might be keen fruit growers and you'll find actually virtually all virtually all fruit trees will be grafted. So you will have your variety or what we call your scion grafted onto a rootstock. 
Um, and again, you also have this with ornamental trees where you might want a, you know, a tree that has a particular characteristic. This could be a leaf coloration. It could be bark coloration or it could be a berry. You will often have this tree grafted onto a rootstock of the same family that maybe will um, control the size of the growth or support it around disease resistance. So it's quite common for trees to be grafted. So what a graft is, it's where you have one section of tree um, that's grafted onto a, another section, that's the scion, which is our variety, which is grafted onto the rootstock. And what the rootstock does, the rootstock has a couple of functions. So it can control the vigor um, of the tree. So it might be that you're trying to create a tree for a small space and you want it to be less vigorous. Um, it could be that you're trying to create some trained fruit, maybe a cordon or an espalier, for example. So the root rootstock, rootstock will control that vigor. Um, rootstocks are also helpful where you've maybe got a tree that needs a certain soil condition. So you've got a, a certain soil condition in your area. Um, some rootstocks are more suit, suited to certain soils than others. Uh, and another important function of a rootstock, they can help with disease resistance as well. So rootstocks are normally bred and you'll get um, some that are more resistant to particular diseases than others. So if you've got a prevalent disease in your area, it's very useful um, to be looking for a more specialist um, rootstock. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please, Adam? So if you have a look at this slide here, um, this, is, this is a nice example of some rootstocks. And what we've got in the picture on the left, we've actually got a rootstock bed. So that's a group of rootstocks that have been planted out and they're actually waiting um, to be grafted. So again, when you get your rootstocks, you can pop them straight into a bed and then you can, when you're ready or it's the right time of year, you can then graft onto those and lift them, um, ready to be used wherever you want them. The picture on the right, where you can see a little bit more growth, so you can see quite a lot of leaf matter, this is actually a rootstock bed, and this is a way that you can grow your own rootstock. So what you can do when you have a rootstock, if you were to take your stock and lay it down, so this is very similar to the layering principle, and you can pin down your rootstock very much as you would a layer, and then that will encourage lots of lateral growth. So what you can see in the picture is lots of lateral growth growing upwards, and then you can build up some um, sawdust. So you could build up some sawdust around that growth. And then over time, probably within a growing season, all of that lateral growth will root into the sawdust and you can create um, your own rootstock. So you can then remove the sawdust, cut those off, and you've got some brand new rootstocks that can be potted up. Very similar to the hardwood cuttings. So they look very similar to the hardwood cuttings. Someone asked earlier about um, hazel. And so you do the same principle with hazel that you actually create a stool. So you can coppice your hazel hard once it's established, and then you can build up around that coppice stool and encourage the new stems to root into that surrounding soil. So you can potentially use quite a loose soil or a sawdust around that manner. That's called hazel stooling. Um, and we've got very we've got different types of rootstocks. So if you move on to the next slide, please. Um, there we go. This is a this is a nice illustration just showing you some of the different types of rootstocks um, that are available and the different sizes that are available. So again, they go from very dwarfing, which for an apple would be something like your M27, all the way through to your very vigorous, um, which would be an M an M25. Um, what you'll find that rootstocks also control the, um, the fruiting of a tree. So if you were to grow a tree on its own roots, it would often grow into a very big tree. So a full size um, orchard tree in the case of a fruit tree. And it may well take 10 to 15 years to actually produce fruit for you. If you grow it onto a less vigorous uh, rootstock, you'll often get fruiting a lot earlier. So it's a way that you can get fruit trees to bear a crop for you within a couple of years. Uh, and also, if you wanted to train your fruit trees, again, you're going to want to think about using maybe a, um, a semi-dwarfing uh, rootstock, which is probably quite useful if you're going to be growing a cordon, uh, a small fan or a smaller spalier. Um, so something like that would be an M26, which is currently used, currently used for apples. Um, or you could look at maybe like an MM106, which is a semi-vigorous rootstock, which would be good for a small orchard tree or a very large um, espalier, for example. When you pick um, your rootstock for whatever fruit you're grafting, it needs to be compatible. Um, so generally, for an apple, you're, you're grafting onto an apple rootstock. 
Um, the, the most common are the mauling series. So th those are denoted with the M. So the M9s, the M26, they were all um, created on the East, the East Mauling Research Centre. Um, so they're very, very common um, apple roots that are good to start with. And in the same way, if you were looking to maybe graft a plum, so prunus, you might be looking at St. Julian A, um, which is very similar to an MM106 for an apple. Um, and possibly for a cherry, you'd be looking at um, Colt. Um, it's a good it's a good rootstock for a cherry. I'm not going to go into a vast amount of detail um, on rootstocks, say, because it's quite a big subject and there's lots of different rootstocks available. But if you go onto some of the, um, the commercial supplier websites, you can find these tables, you can find lists of rootstocks, which will give you advice and guidance on the best rootstock um, for your conditions and for your situation. Great. If you want to move on to the next slide. Lovely. So the next slide, we've got a nice example here of where we've got a graft union. So these two slides show you where we've got our scion that has been successfully um, grafted onto our rootstock. These trees have been planted out. And one of the important things to remember is when you plant out a grafted tree, you need to make sure that your graft union is well above the soil level. Because what will happen if you plant it too low and there's a risk that your scion is going to become going to come in contact with the soil or your mulch, there's a risk that it could actually root down on its own roots, develop its own roots and push down away from the rootstock. And then you'll lose all of those beneficial properties of the rootstock. So it's really important that you make sure you've got the graft union, as we call it, which is that kind of that swelling where the two the two plants are fused well above soil level. Great, you can go on to the next slide, please. Now, here's, here's a nice example. So if you look at the, the picture on the left, the picture on the left actually shows the base of a, of a Victoria plum tree. And what you can see around the base of that tree, that's lots of growth that's actually coming from the rootstock. Um, so that's the, that's the rootstock growth. So that may well be a St. Julian A rootstock coming up. And normally what you'd want to do within an orchard environment, you'd want to remove that because you don't want it competing with your, your actual variety that you're growing. But what you might want to think about looking at that is something I spoke about earlier. You could happily lay all of those stems down and create an abundance of new rootstocks by doing some layers. So you could do a ground layer by just laying those down. That's going to give you some new rootstock to propagate against. So when you're doing grafting, I always suggest, you know, when you're doing your sort of seasonal pruning of your orchard trees, try and save that material. Don't throw it away. Use it either to produce new rootstocks or to produce new scion wood. And then if you look at the picture on the right, so the picture on the right is actually a quince. So that's a quince that's struggling. Um, it's actually dying back within the crown. And as a result, it's putting on some growth lower down. So the, the branches that you can see coming out from the side of the trunk, they're actually coming out from the scion. So they're not from the rootstock, they're slightly higher up. They're coming out from the scion. So you could actually cut those off and use those to graft onto a quince rootstock. So again, you've got that benefit that you can take shoots from your upper section from your to a scion to create new fruiting wood. And you could also take um, material from your rootstock to create more rootstocks. Great, next slide, please. OK, we've got a lovely illustration here that's showing you how to actually do some tea budding. So there's a nice picture of me um, removing a bud um, from a piece of apple. So there are different times of year um, when you can do different types of grafting technique. We're, we're literally just coming to the end of the budding season. So this is when you can do budding, chip budding and tea budding. And what that involves it revolves the removal of a single bud um, from a from a from a stem and actually joining that onto your rootstock. So you can see in the picture on the left, um, I'm removing a stem, and then on the right, it's showing how you can actually insert that into your rootstock. And if you just want to stop the slideshow for a second, Andy, I've got an, uh, um, Andy, I've got an example here that I can just show everyone. So again, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so what we want to be doing when we're doing a, a bud is we're actually removing oh, we're removing a little bud from a branch just like that. And so in the in the diagram, you saw me with a, a grafting knife just removing a sliver of a bud 
um, from there. It's quite important that we don't want to be touching um, that section that we've removed because you can get oil from your fingers can actually prevent that from adhering to the rootstock. So what I like to do is when I've removed them, I tend to put them in water and that just keeps them moist and stops them from drying out. And then if you have a look on this plant, I've actually joined a bud onto a rootstock. And what I'm gonna do, this is one I did earlier. I'm just gonna unwrap this, just that I'm kind of showing you in reverse to show you how you achieve it. So this would be my finished graft. I'm just going to unwrap this with my, so I've just wrapped that with parafilm. I'm going to unwrap. And then if you have a look, you can see that's my little bud that I've inserted into my rootstock. So when you, when you, what you do, you remove your, you remove your bud from your scion, and then you do a corresponding cut on your rootstock, and you do a little downward cut on the bottom, and what that allows you to do, it allows you to insert that bud into that clip. Now, the important thing is when you're doing any sort of grafting, you want to make sure that your scion wood is around about the same girth as your rootstock. So you want them to be comparable thicknesses because you want them to marry up and almost be identical. And then if you have a look at our bud as well, what you've got around the edge of that bud is where you've got all the cambium tissue. And you need that cambium tissue to be meeting with the cambium tissue, the equal cambium tissue on your rootstock. So you want them to be very, very comparable. Um, what you can do, sometimes you may not get your cut exactly right. So you may potentially need to just kind of kind of offset that a little bit. So as long as the as long as the cambium's meeting somewhere along that union, then the bud has a chance of taking. But ideally, we want it to be perfectly lined up and perfectly matched. OK, so once you've got your bud in place, you would then rewrap it um, with your with your parafilm to get it wrapped up. I won't rewrap that now just to save on time. I'm just going to bring the slides back up, Phil. I'm just conscious Lovely. of time for everybody. Um, I'd like to find out about. Great. So, there's, so there's a nice example of doing our chip budding. Let's move on to the next slide, please, Nanny. And so the other the other technique that you can use for your grafting is a whip and tongue graft. So again, this is a graft that you do in the autumn when the plant's dormant and you're removing a much bigger section um, of the cutting. But again, it's the same principle that you're taking your rootstock and you're joining it to your um, your scion on top. Um, and if you have a look at the diagram on the left, you can see that that's a an illustration showing you the cut that you can use. Um, and actually, if you if you just stop that slide there, Annie, I've got a nice example of a um, a whip and tongue graft here. So this is a Bramley apple um, that's been grafted onto an MM106, and you can see quite nicely I've I've labelled it here. And you can see here this is our graft union in terms of where those have been joined. So this was done in February of last year, and you can see it's taken quite nicely. And what I used in this in this situation is I actually used grafting tool, which I said I was going to talk to you about earlier. Now, this grafting tool, I'm just going to show you this quickly. because It's very useful. And what this does for you, if you're not happy or comfortable using a grafting knife, you can use a grafting tool. And what this does is it produces your grafting cut for you. So if you have a look here, what the tool does, it basically produces two corresponding cuts. So that's where I've just cut my scion wood. But you can imagine if you do a reverse cut on your rootstock, it shows you how you can really easily join your rootstock into your scion and bond it together. So really useful tool if you're not comfortable using a knife. Great. I can pop the last slide on, please, Annie. I think we're just waiting for the last slides to come. So that's that's given you a really quick overview um, of some vegetated propagation. As I as I said, you know that it's it's a very big subject. We've got one last slide here that's showing you a framework graph. So this is a more sophisticated graft, and this is where you're actually grafting onto an established tree. So this could be if you're regenerating an orchard tree, or you're potentially um, grafting onto quite a large rootstock that you've allowed to develop. 
And what you do is you create a framework within the tree, and then you're then using what we call some cleft graphs to graft into that. And it might be that you want to put a new variety onto an existing tree or reinvigorate a failing tree potentially. And the advantage of this is that you've already got those established roots. Um, but again, there's this is quite a quite a more involved um, technique. So again, if you were interested in maybe doing a framework graph, this is something you might need to research and get a little bit more information. Um, that's given you a really uh, a really brief overview of vegetative propagation. So I think what we'll do, we're just going to move to any questions um, that are outstanding around some of those topics that I've covered. I think you're on mute, Annie. Cheers. Thank you, Phil. Really appreciate that. So it's just like magic, just watching <laughs> roots to be able to come for, from sticks, as it were. So no, absolutely brilliant. Um, we've had a question from Lisa. She's after a large quantity of rowan and alder. Um, would um, any of these techniques be the best for, for creating Owen and, rowan and alder? I, I'd opt if you, I'd opt for growing those from seed. So again, if you're if you're just looking for um, native mount native mountain ash, um, I would again, you know, do your seed collection. So if you missed if you missed John's um, webinar last week, which was all about um, seed gathering, and we've got the um, tree growers guide as well, I'd say they'd be much better to grow from seed because you'll get much higher volumes growing from seed. Perfect. And linking from that, Felicity's asking about the ginkgo tree. Would that be one that would be the best? ginkgo? So, so yeah, ginkgo, ginkgo. You could do as a vegetative propagation. So you could do ginkgo from a cutting. Yeah, brilliant. I've um, never tried it. I've never tried it myself. So slightly more difficult. Um, but yeah, you can take it. You can do it from a cutting. Brilliant. Um, Michael's just asking what you're using to seal the wound when you do a framework graft. Right, so what you can use, so you've obviously got your, your parafilm that you can use for wrapping. Um, with a framework graft, you can use you can use a wound paint um, or it's, a, it's like a grafting wax, or you can use natural beeswax as well. Now it's quite important that you do actually seal over because you don't want any moisture to get in. You don't want rainwater pooling and going in, which cause, could cause infection. And you're trying to keep the whole of that joint uh, moist and hydrated, so you don't want it drying out. So it's around, keeping it moist inside and then making sure no rain's getting in. G general principle, we don't, we don't kind of support using wound paints where you might be you might be pruning a tree. So if you're pruning a branch off, historically people used to use wound paints, but that can seal infection in. But if you're doing grafting, it's a different matter that you need to keep that, you know, that union kind of dry and clean and moist. That makes sense. Brilliant. Um, Rosie's asking us about aftercare for the cuttings. So she wants to know, should they be, should she be cutting them back in the first year of growth on rooted hardwood cuttings or air layered cuttings to encourage that stronger plant? Or should she wait a bit longer after a few years of growth before cutting them? No, so I, I mean, with an air layer, I would, I would leave it and let it establish some root. Obviously, if it's got a good growing medium, it will establish some root. Having the top growth is obviously going to be creating lots of energy that it can then push down into the root pool. If it's something that does fruit, you probably want to be removing any flower so that you're not encouraging it to put on fruit and berry. You want it to be developing it down into the root stock. But having the leaf area is quite useful because that will help with that energy generation. Um, and again, with a if you've done a hardwood cutting, I'd allow that to develop a good, good amount of top growth before you think about cutting it back. Um, you may want to think about the final shape that you want from your from your tree originally. And so if you I mean, if you have done a graft, for example, then you might want to think about training it quite early. So if you've, you're doing trained fruit, you'll start kind of shaping it um, following the first year following planting. So if you are doing something trained, then you could intervene a little bit earlier. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and we've uh, got a question here from Chris. He's asking about best practice for propagating lime trees. So mature limes and old apple varieties, which um, right. practice I'm, you use? I'm not a big I'm not a big expert on lime, so I might have to. If you take your details, Chris, I might have to come back to you um, on that one. So I'll ask one of my colleagues. But hey, lime is one of my specialities. He does also ask about old apple varieties as well. So I mean, any any of the the techniques that I've mentioned um, in terms of the grafting would be good for for old apples. So again. If you've got any regenerating growth, so that's a nice bit of healthy young growth. So you'll often have an old apple tree 
that could well have some internal shoots, you could use those, you know, as your scion would to retain that old variety and just make sure that you're growing it on an appropriate rootstock. So you want the right rootstock for your situation. So a good example, I've got some Bramley here, so a cooker. I probably wouldn't want to put that on a small rootstock because it's got quite a big apple. So I probably want that on a slightly bigger rootstock for a bigger tree rather than having it on a dwarfing rootstock, for example, where the, the fruit's going to outweigh the size of the growth. But again, old, old fruit trees, very easy to, you know, to graft, to actually get some legacy and, and kind of retain that tree if it's failing. Brilliant. And we've got time for just one more question. So um, Katie's asked about the best trees to take cuttings from rather than seed. So what would be the best ones to do that? Um, you mentioned willow and dogwood. Uh, are there any other woodland tree species um, that you'd recommend? Um, I mean, London, London Plains, another species that does really does really well from cuttings. Poplar as well. So poplar is a really good one to do from a from a hardwood cutting. So those would be good ones to start from. Most trees, most trees you can actually take cuttings from. But again, some are going to be more successful from your softwood cuttings, which are a little bit more vulnerable. So it's having the right setup. If you've got a greenhouse or you might have a propagator, then I would say, you know, do have a go at doing some softwoods, but you're going to have to be a lot more engaged with them. With the hardwoods, you can generally take them, put them in the ground and put them in a pot and forget about them, dig them up the next season, and you've generally got rooting. With a softwood, you need to be monitoring and making sure that it doesn't it doesn't dry out at all. So, you know, you can, you can do lots of cuttings from a lot of the conifers um, as well, for example. But again, they would, they would tend to be that you'd be doing smaller cuttings that are more vulnerable to drying out. So I'd say if you're new to it, start with the hardwoods. If you want to do something a little bit more advanced, it'll give you a broader range of species. You'll be looking more at softwood cuttings, but you may need some more specialist equipment or maybe work with a local partner who's got that equipment where you can actually do, do that and maybe having a mist unit or a propagator. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Phil. I'm afraid, everyone, we've run out of time. Um, we will stay on a little bit longer and just check the question and answer box um, that we've answered everything for you. Uh, I want to say thank you so much, Phil, for your expertise. Um, absolutely fascinating. I've learned loads and can't wait to get started. So really appreciate that. And thank you so much, everybody, for coming along. Uh, it's great to see so many people interested in the topic. So I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. And thank you very much for joining us. Great. Thank you, everyone. Cheers.